Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you guys are here, especially if you're joining us on, uh, in person. I mean, there's like a special place in heaven for you guys uh, for coming out today. Uh, I also want to say thank you for joining us online. If you're watching at home, there's not as special of a place in heaven for you, but we're still grateful. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, maybe. Um, we're so grateful that you guys are here. Our hope and prayer is that this become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. Uh, I want to let you know about something that's happening today. Uh, it is a big day in the life of our church. Uh, if you're new, uh, my, my encouragement is just like watch our church in action. Uh, there's like no better day to see what our church is all about, what we're for, and all of that. But right now we're in an initiative called For the Church, For the City. Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to raise enough money to be able to get into a permanent facility for our church. We started this last year, and we saw God do some great things. We were, uh, the goal, uh, the ultimate goal was $4 million. Uh, we, we reached 95% of that, which is great. But with people moving away and you have that 5% gap. Uh, the goal is to raise an additional 500,000 uh, to be able to, uh, of commitments to be able to be raised over the next year. And uh, if we do that, we'll be able to get into our own facility. And here's why we, there's a couple reasons we need our own facility. Number one, um, we're not able to do some of the things we want to do as a church because we rent out a school. Uh, so even today, we had baptisms planned. We're not allowed to do baptisms inside. And we thought it best not to kill people outside. So um, I mean, think about baptisms. Like that's a, that's a key moment in the faith of, of somebody. And to be able to not do that, I mean, to have to push that back uh, because we don't have our own facility is just not what we want to be about. It's the first time we've ever had to cancel baptisms um, uh, because, of, because of weather. And so, um, you know, be able to have our own place for that. And not only that, but uh, we just believe our own place will allow us to reach more people, to reach more thousands of people uh, for Christ, to be able to care for more people. Uh, as a church, since we've started, we're nine years old. We've been in nine different locations, which is not a recipe for success, by the way. Uh, but God has been super faithful. God has just shown up every step of the way. Um, and since we started as a church, we've given away almost $1.4 million uh, to families in need, to uh, missionaries, to organizations, to uh, start new churches. We've started 31 new churches since we started, most of those right here on the Front Range. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, so we've been able to, to see God, you know, use us to be able to plant new life-giving communities throughout uh, the world. Um, uh, we've been able to give away over 300,000 meals to families in need right in our own town. I mean, so like God has used us in some incredible ways. And the greatest generator of funds for missions and for uh, caring for people across the world is the American church. It is the greatest generator of funds. That is a proven fact. And so when the American church thrives, then missions and, and the caring for people and serving people also thrives. And so as a church, we know that getting our own place is going to allow us um, to do even greater things uh, for the kingdom of God and for God's glory. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a commitment Sunday um, uh, toward the end of the service. I, I'll let you know when. Uh, what I'm asking you to do, if you call Front Range home, if you don't call Front Range home, just sit back. Just, this isn't for you. But if you call Front Range Home, what I'm going to ask you to do is fill out a commitment card. Even if you already have. If you're like, man, I've done this. Here's what I know. There's uh, one of three types of people in here if you call Front Range Home or watching online. We have it online as well. Um, uh, one of three types. One type is those of you who made a commitment last year and you're like, man, that's, that's all I can do. That's awesome. Thank you. Just keep giving that. Keep doing that. There's actually a box there that says I'm maintaining my current commitment. So just check that. So fill out your information, check that. There's some of us, and this is my wife and I, uh, where God has created more margin in our lives over the last year. For us, we've sold a ton of stuff in the last year. So because of that margin, we're able to increase um, our, our commitment. So we, we did that a couple weeks ago. And maybe there's some of you that you've either finished your commitment or you're like, man, God's given us some margin and uh, we want to be able to do more. And if that's you, then there's a box there that says, hey, this is what my new commitment is. And then we also know that our church has grown pretty substantially over the last year. Uh, the month of September, we were over 30% in growth, which uh, large church growth is about 7%. So we were over 30%, which is four times that, which is amazing. Um, uh, but that means there's a lot of people that weren't a part of For the Church for the City last year. And so we're saying, hey, why don't you join? Why don't you be a part? And again, there's a box for that. So here's what I'm asking. 
If you're part of Front Range, I want, I'm asking every person to fill us out at some point in the service, and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of direct you later. But we have buckets up here. We'll ask you to come forward. There's some rocks. If you didn't get a rock last year, it's got For the Church for the City on there. Or maybe you lost your rock in the last year. Uh, mine, I told you guys last year, would be by my sink in my bathroom, and it's still there. Uh, it reminds me to pray for every time I see it. Uh, pray for the, what God's choosing to do here. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Uh, if we're able to raise this, then we, I, I've been told, and I just talked to uh, the, the project manager right after service because he goes to our church now. Uh, I was just told that uh, we'll be in within a year. Um, so it'll be nice that this time next year, we won't have to cancel baptisms because of a lot of snow or cold or anything like that. So that's what we're praying for. Um, and he, here's just, just a, a cool concept uh, that came to me this past week, that, that God owns everything and God chooses to give to you and I. And then when we give, God calls us generous. Think about that for a moment. Like God owns everything, and he chooses to give to you and I. And then when you and I are generous, when we choose to give, God's like, you're, you're being generous. Like the God of the universe actually calls us generous. So my prayer is that God will see my commitment or my wife's commitment, and he'll call us generous. It'll see our church, and he'll call us generous. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and uh, God, we just ask that you would do something mighty. That, Father, you would just show up in such a powerful way in the life of our church. Uh, Father, that you would uh, provide these funds that, God, we'd be able to get into this building. God, I thank you for everything that's happened, the groundbreaking, just all the things that have happened so far to get us to this point. Now, God, we're asking you to, um, to help us get us over that finish line there, God, so that we can serve more people and care for more people and help more people come into your kingdom, Father. Father, we want you to be given all the glory, so use us, God. May you stretch us. May we step out in faith and are giving God and trust you with what we're going to do. It's in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, have you ever said you believe something, but your actions or your lifestyle didn't reflect it? Yeah, have you ever been there? Like, like the other day I was with a, a group of guys and one of the guys was like, man, I love junk food and I love eating it, but I know I need to stop and I know I need to lose weight, but man, I just can't. And I'm like, amen, amen, I'm right there with you. You know, I, I thought about when I was younger, uh, when I was like 16, 17 years old, I heard about compound interest and saving ret for retirement and all of that. I'm like, all oh, that sounds great. Like, I get all that sounds awesome, but I'm 17. I want, like, new shoes, you know. I want to, like, go do something else. I'm not saving for my retirement one day. Like, you can say that you believe something, but your choices and your lifestyle might not actually reflect your belief. Well, I think that's true for faith with the, this idea of faith for a lot of people. I think there's a lot of people that say they believe something, say that they have faith in Christ, say that they have faith in God, but their lifestyle or their choices may not reflect that faith. Right now we're in a series on the book of James, and uh, we just started it last week. And I want to encourage you, if you missed last week's message or if you want to grow at all in your faith, we do these, these series hubs for every single series that we do. We put them on our website, so you can go to frontrange.org. You can scan the QR code in your worship guide, and you can go to our series hubs, and you can find all kinds of resources. There's reading plans. There's all kinds of things to, to help you grow in your faith. Because uh, our desire is that you wouldn't just come here on a Sunday and listen to a message, but you, you would take God's word and you would be reading it on your own and, and applying things in your own life and, and all of that. That's how we grow in our faith. So we provided all of these resources for you. So if you just go to our series hubs, you can get all of that, including last week's message where we started the series. The uh, book of James is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Uh, I, I know Pastor Johnny, he said that last week. Uh, he's just copying me. Um, no, we can, we can have about the same, the same favorites. I love the book of James. It's, my, it's one of my favorites for a few reasons. One, it's one of the earliest written books in the New Testament. It was written between 10 to 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Think about that for a moment. Now, if you study ancient texts, then you know that, that most texts, when they're written about somebody or something that happened, they're written hundreds of years later, most of them. Like you take the Iliad or the Odyssey or something like that, it's hundreds of years later. Jesus was 10 years earlier to this text. That means that there's a lot of people that are still living that could be like, ah, that's not what happened. Eh, we didn't see that. Hey, we, we, we discredit what James is saying, but no one does. Another reason it's one of my favorite books is because it, taught, it, it de really deals with Christian living. I mean, the whole focus of it is how do you and I live as followers of Christ in our world? Whether the world is back then or whether the world is today, how do we follow Christ in the world that we live in? And then it's one of my favorite texts primarily because it was written by James 
who's the half-brother of Jesus. Now think about that for a moment. How many of you, by show of hands, how many of you have siblings? Anybody have siblings? Okay, a lot of us. Imagine your sibling coming to you and being like, yo, I'm God. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like you wouldn't, you wouldn't play that game, right? I mean, think about James. I mean, imagine your brother being Jesus, right? Like imagine the times. I'm sure there was a time where Mary was like, James, why can't you be more like your brother? Like, he's perfect. I can't be more like him. You know, and so James is not only a follower of Jesus, uh, they, we're, we're told that he's the leader of the early church, and he's the leader of the Jewish council, or the Jerusalem council in 50 AD. So he's like big time in the church. But then what he calls himself in James chapter 1, verse 1, is he says, I'm a servant of Jesus. Now, my sister would have to die and raise herself from the dead for me to be a servant of her. You know what I'm saying? Like, to me, James is one of the most prominent reasons that we can believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Because at any point, James could have been like, that wasn't my upbringing. Nope, I saw Jesus sin. Nope, I saw, that, that did not happen. But he doesn't. In fact, he not only doesn't say those things, he follows Christ and says that I am his servant. Now, James, the whole theme of the letter is telling us how to live out faith. And today, he's going to specifically look at this idea of how you can't just say you have faith. You've got to do something with your faith. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. Hey, if you need a Bible, um, as you're running back to your car through the snow, uh, stop off at our connection tent. We'd love to get you one. We don't need your name, your money, none of that stuff. We just want to make sure that God's word is in everybody's hand uh, so that you can take advantage of, of what he says. Uh, let me set it up. James chapter 1. Um, we learned a lot last week uh, about how God calls us to be complete and mature, not lacking anything. Uh, Pastor Johnny talked about how if you, if you need wisdom, then you have to seek it. You have to ask for it. And then you got to actually do what God tells you to do. And then James, toward the end, um, uh, he makes some, uh, a powerful statement. He says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. So James, what he's doing, he's saying, hey, you can't just come to church. You can't just listen to the Bible app. You can't just read the Bible. you got to actually do what God's word says. And he's setting us up for James chapter 2. Look at verse 14. Here's what it says. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? So he's starting this conversation about faith. He's saying the, the whole topic we're going to discuss today is, is on faith. And so what is faith? Well, the, the word faith that he uses there in the Greek is pistis. And pistis literally means to have a firm persuasion, uh, a firm conviction uh, or trust in something. We know that faith is essential to Christian living. I mean, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says that it is impossible to please God without what? Without faith. And so faith is essential Right? We get that. We understand that. So James is saying, we're going to dive into this topic of faith. And what, it is that, what does it actually mean? Look at verse 15. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? He says, you can't just call yourself a follower of Christ. And then somebody, some follower of Jesus, some brother or sister in Christ comes to you and says that they have a need, and you just go, ah, oh, man, I'm sorry. I'll pray for you. He says, if you have the ability to meet that need, you've got to meet the need. It's not enough just to say that you, you, you care for people and you'll pray for people and all of that, but you have to actually do something about it. He's setting us up with, for this topic of faith, and he's saying that everybody has faith. In these, these following verses, he's going to tell us that everybody has some type of faith. Even last week, I was in a, an Uber with a, uh, the, the driver. He, he claimed himself to be a Jewish atheist. And even that guy in our conversation, like, he has faith. He has a certain type of faith. Now, James says that there's three types of faith that you can have. And that every person in here and every person watching online, you're going to fall into one of these three types of faith in your life. The first type of faith is dead faith. Dead faith. Look at verse 17, it says, in the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. He's saying there are people that they were literally say, hey, I have faith in Christ. I have faith in God. But their lifestyle, their, 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 their deeds, what they do, don't reflect what they say they believe. 
that they can say that they're followers of Jesus. They can say that with their mouths, but it doesn't mean they're living that way. Like they, they can say that they follow what God says, but then when God tells them to do something in, in the Bible, they're like, ah, no, I'm good. And so James is saying it's not enough just to say with your mouth that you're a follower of Jesus. You have to actually live it with your life. Now, I have to make a clear distinction here. I have to make it very clear that what James is not saying is that salvation is through works. He's not saying that you and I are saved by our works. I mean, he and Paul make it very clear that salvation is by grace through faith. He makes that very clear that it is by grace, by God's grace, undeserved favor through faith. So that's how we are saved. But what what James is saying here is there's a dichotomy between your faith and your works, meaning that you can't just say you believe in salvation. You've got to actually show it with your life, that people should be able to look at your life and go, man, there's something different about them, not just because you say something, not just because you say you go to church, but because your life reflects God's word. There's a dichotomy between faith and works, and that your salvation is based on grace through faith, but it must be accompanied with action. There's got to be something else with it. If you're Christian by name only, if you're a nominal Christian, you have dead faith. That's what James is saying here. It's not enough just to say that you're a follower of Christ. You've got to actually show it with your actions. So this first type of faith is dead faith. The second type is demonic faith. Demonic faith. Now, that sounds, that sounds pretty severe. So what in the world is demonic faith? Look at verse 19. It says, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Now, when he says that, hey, when James says that you believe that there is one God, what he's referencing is the Shema. The Shema is a, a, a prayer that faithful Jews would pray multiple times a day. And the prayer would start with, there is one God. There is but one God. So when he says this, he's saying, you pray that prayer, that's good. It means nothing. I remember the first time that that I remember praying, it was, I was 12 or 13 years old, and uh, my grandma, I was over at her house, and she said, hey, I want you to come pray with me me before we go to bed. And so we prayed this prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, if I should die before I wake. Some of you guys have prayed that prayer. Some of you may have prayed that prayer with your own grandparents. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't even believe that God exists, but I'm praying this prayer with her. Why? Because she asked me. She's my grandma. I'll do anything for my grandma, but I don't believe it, and it didn't change my life. It was just words. It was just words that I was speaking. James is saying that's demonic faith. He says, let me, let me make it real clear to you. Think about Satan. Does Satan believe that there's one God? Yeah, he does. He worked for him. Does Satan believe that Jesus is the only way? Yeah. Because he, he was momentarily happy when Christ died. So he's like, okay, we're good. The veil's torn. We're good. Satan is as orthodox as it comes. It's what he does with that belief. You and I, we can be orthodox. We can have the right belief system. But if our life doesn't change because of it, It's meaningless. Let me say it another way. To believe that there is one God, to believe in God, and to not do what he says is sin. To believe that God is real, to believe that he exists, to believe that he knows you and he loves you, and all to believe all of that and to not do what he says is sin. It's demonic faith. None of us want that. So there's dead faith, there's demonic faith, and lastly, there's dynamic faith. See the alliteration there? I mean, I'm not a Baptist, but that's good Baptist messaging right there. Yeah, I appreciate that. Dynamic faith. So there's dead, there's demonic, and there's dynamic faith. Look at verse 20. It says this, you foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. I want to be called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do, not by faith alone. 
In the same way was not even Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. So James is saying, hey, genuine, real, dynamic faith, you've got to believe, of course, but you have to do something with your belief. Now, we have to understand, James is writing this letter to to really counteract what some people were saying. There were some people at that point that were saying, hey, you could be a Christian and your actions really don't matter. Like you can, as long as you believe in Jesus, then it doesn't really matter what you do with your life. As long as you believe that Christ was raised from the dead and and all of that, then your actions really don't matter. Like, you don't really have to believe that this is God's word. You could just do whatever you feel like. You you don't have to be generous. You don't have to give up sin or any, you don't have to do any of that. And James is like, that's not true. I need you as followers of Jesus to understand what God's word says, and that is that if you say you believe in Christ, your actions have to follow. You can't just say you believe and not do. When you look in scripture, the one common denominator of people who please God with their faith, the one common denominator of every major person in scripture that pleased God by their faith was obedience. It was people that said, hey, we believe in God. We believe that God's word is real. We believe this is what God has told us, and we're going to do it. And then he gives examples. He says, think about Abraham. So Abraham, if you don't know the story, Abraham, he was told by God that he would be the father of many nations. Imagine that. Imagine like that being your promise from God. You can be the father of many nations. That's amazing. The problem is Abraham's over 100 years old and he's got one child. Well, one legitimate child at this point. And he's young. And God tells him, I want you to go sacrifice him. That's a crazy Crazy thing. Hold on, God. You told me I'd be the father of many nations. I only got one legitimate child here, and you're telling me to go kill him? I mean, I got a lot of issues with that. But it says that Abraham trusted him. What did he trust him on? He trusted him on his word, that you would be the father of many nations. Okay, I don't know how you're going to do it. This seems ridiculous, but it's, I- I'm going to obey. And so right before he does it, God steps in, saves his son, and tells him, you are righteous. He says, okay, but also let's think about Rahab. I mean, Rahab is like the least likely person to be listed in this, this genealogy of people with faith. I mean, she is a non-Jew prostitute, right? Like, if, you, if I were to say, hey, like, tell me people that, that you would say, the, the, these people are of great faith. These people have incredible faith. You would, you would say maybe like Billy Graham or something like that. Like, you would give me people that were like, yeah, wow, their lives really reflected that too, you wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, and the non-Jewish prostitute. Right? Like you wouldn't put her in that same category, and yet James does. Why? Because she wasn't raised to believe in the same God of the Bible. She was raised to believe different things, and yet when these foreigners come in, she hears about this God, and she wants to serve him. And so she's, she's willing to give up her life. She risks her life for them and their God. He says that's the type of faith. The examples of real faith that James gives us, they're risky. I mean, they, it's action that seems impossible. It's action that seems honestly downright dangerous. Saying, this is the type of faith I want you to have. This is the type of faith that changes the world. This is the type of faith that saves. And he finishes it up with verse 26. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. He's like, I need to give you another analogy here. Like if he was talking to us today, he might say, hey, you can't drive your car anywhere without putting gas in it first. Or you're not going to have a great marriage without having love and sacrifice as a part of it. Like you just, it just, you can't have that. The same is true. You cannot have real faith without action, without words. You can't be somebody who say, says that you're a follower of Jesus. Ernest, you can't be somebody that says that you have faith without your actions displaying it. One theologian, he commented on this verse. Now remember, James says this, as the body without spirit is dead. So he's talking about death. So faith without deeds is dead. This theologian, he, he makes this observation. He says, unfortunately, the stench of death 
hovers over many of our churches and over many of the lives of professing Christians. Often we have mouthed the correct confessions and mastered the orthodox theology, but our faith has been dead. Dead faith doesn't change the world. It's only dynamic faith. You look out throughout history of the world, you look through the history of Scripture, and the only people who changed the world, the only people who changed communities and lives around them were people with dynamic faith, people that believed and did. And so what type of faith do you have? Like when you look at your life, for me, I don't, I, I, I can look at it like all-encompassing, but I try to like look at areas of my life like, what type of faith do I have in my home? Do I have dead faith, demonic faith, dynamic faith? Like is Christ at the center of my home? Is he at the center of my marriage, of my parenting, of our finances? Is he at the center of everything that we do? And there's times where I could say yes to that. I'm like, oh, yeah, man, I'm living dynamic faith right now. And there's other times I'll be real honest. I'm like, oh, my faith is pretty dead. Like Christ is not the center of my parenting right now. Christ is not the center of whatever it may be. So is Christ at the center of, of each area of your life? Do you have dynamic faith when it comes to your neighboring? When it comes to loving people around you? When it comes to when you walk into that coffee shop that you go into all the time? When you walk into your workplace? When you walk, wherever it may be, is like your faith guiding you? Is it directing what you do? Or would people say, well, you're just like everybody else? So it's more like dead faith. There's a proclamation of something, but it's not being lived out. What type of faith do you want? I think all of us would say dynamic faith for sure. But when you look at every, every area of your life, if you would say, yes, man, I'm, I'm living dynamic faith in every area. That's awesome. Keep going. Don't allow comfort or the challenges or anything like that to sidetrack you. But if you're like me, where you can identify an area of your life where you're like, hmm, now that area might be, it might be more classified as dead than it is dynamic. Then what do you need to do? What changes do you need to make? Maybe it's getting into God's presence more. Maybe it's making your faith more of a priority. Maybe it's just choosing to open your mouth and letting people know around you where you stand, who you worship, how you love, all of that. The world desperately needs you and I to have dynamic faith. This whole For the Church for the City is an opportunity for us to have dynamic faith. Like when we started this last year and we said, okay, you're going to have, you know, kind of two responses. When you're thinking through, like, what are you going to give to the building and all of that? You're going to have a faith number and you're going to have a safe number. And the safe number is like where I want to land, to be real honest. Like that's easy. That's like, oh, yeah, we could do that. And that won't like make us change a whole lot of things in our, in our life. But is that dynamic faith? If dynamic faith is risky and dangerous and something that like my extended family would say, Ernest, I don't know if that's wise of you. Like, that's probably not the best decision you can make for your future or your retirement or whatever. Then that's not dynamic faith. What type of faith am I living? And so this opportunity for us as a church, and again, man, if you're not part of Front Range right now, if you're like, it's cool, it's my first time and all that, just sit back, just chill. But if you call Front Range your home, and we would give you a chance to respond and to live out dynamic faith in this one particular area. So take a moment, fill out this, this card. I'm going to pray for us. And as I do, when I get done, I'm going to ask you just to come forward and you can drop the cards in the buckets. This is your saying, hey, this is our commitment. Again, even if you've already filled this out, even if like you're changing nothing, please just fill it out again. That way we know kind of where we are with all of our commitments. And then if you haven't gotten a rock, we have plenty of rocks. Just be reminded of, hey, this is what God's doing in our church, and we'll be praying for this on a regular basis. And then let's see what God does. Let's see how God's going to use this moment, this time in our church. I mean, imagine a year from now, us being able to have our own home, to be able to do even greater things in our community, greater things in our world, plant more churches, serve more families. All the things that we can do. I mean, Brandon just said over 1,200 people have come to Christ. I mean, imagine where we could be at in five years of establishing our own place, our own home, to be able to love and serve our community in even greater ways. You get to be a part of that. I get to be a part of that. 
So as you pray about your decision, if you've come ready to make that, then come forward. We know there's a lot of people not here this weekend, and so we're going to give opportunities for those people as well. But you can also do it online if you're watching. There's a link right now, and you can do that. But I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to ask you to just come forward, drop those in, and let's worship God through our generosity. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the book of James. God, how challenging this book is to our faith. How James continually calls us out to live a life that is different, to live a life that is risky faith, that seems dangerous in some some ways, but a faith that will change the world. I pray, Father, that we would live that type of faith, Father, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. God, you know where each person is and God, where our faith is dynamic, God, I pray that we would continue that that path, continue going down that road, God, in our faith. But God, in the areas where maybe our faith is is struggling, maybe our our faith seems more dead, it's more lip service than action, God, I pray that you would call us out. I pray, God, you would help us to take steps. And then right now, Father, with this, this moment, the life of our church, this huge moment, God, we're saying, God, use us. May our commitment to you be one of faith. God, I, I pray that you would challenge us that we're going to get uncomfortable. But it's for your glory, and we pray that you would just show up. God, that you would just show up in miraculous ways in our families, in our personal lives, God. We would see you move in such a mighty way, God. We would see that the faith, when we step out, God, that you show up and you do greater things. So, Father, right now in this moment, We ask, Father, for you to be blessed and you to be glorified and that you would use this offering, you would multiply it for your glory and help us to use it, God, to bless you, to bless our community. It's in Jesus' name, amen.